a, a, a person next to you, give them a pat on the back for making it out on nearly sub weather today. I think we normally bring the lights up a little bit about now so I can see a little bit better. Now turn back to the person who patted you on the back and give them a pat on the back too because... <laughs> Pastor Matt said they had free checks this morning woke him up. Are we going to have church? Duh. Of course we're going to have church. Right, Matt? Right. Yeah. That's right. What do we do on Sunday? Church. At church. Yeah. What are we going to do next Sunday? We're going to have church. You know, I, I have heard of churches that, that are canceling services next Sunday. That, that, that doesn't make any sense to me, you know, unless it's uh, bad weather. It's supposed to be good weather is what I hear. Uh, the, the, this day you celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, and then some people say, eh, we don't have church that day, so uh, that doesn't make sense. So you can see that I'm, I'm kind of preaching ahead to the uh, storm that some might come in. Might be coming for some. Um, yes, we will have church this Sunday. We plan to have it an hour long. It is the same time. It's at 1030. There's no Sunday school. There is also no nursery. Don't let that discourage you. Uh, because uh, we want everybody to come in. We can't tell the person who's working the nursery. Uh, you can't celebrate the Lord's birth on uh, a, you, have, you get to watch the kids. And so uh, it will be here one hour long. I'm not going to preach. I was waiting for the amen or the clap on that one. I, I am going to do a live painting again, like I have done on Christmas Eve. We won't have a Christmas Eve service. I am doing a live painting again. Uh, some of you have seen that here. Uh, and uh, i got to figure out between now and, and next Sunday what I'm going to paint. But uh, uh, So that will that, be that'll be my message for that Sunday. Is that Sunday. Also, this Sunday uh, is the Sunday that we give out Mary Lynn and I give out gifts. We don't send Christmas cards. Uh, we give gifts. So uh, every family, even if you were a visitor, even if you were a visitor, you came on the right Sunday, uh, every family, a representative of every family, uh, gets a gift from us. Mary Lynn, has somebody been helping you? Handing out? Dortha and Mary Lynn, Dortha, my mother-in-law, and Mary Lynn will be back there giving out gifts, uh, stuff. So uh, that's good. Addison? You came on the right Sunday. Yay! Hey, Addison told me I need to get off work today so I can go to church. I love Addison. I love her. I love that attitude. Okay, that's enough of that stuff. Uh, Matthew chapter 2 is where we're at today. Um, let, let me just jump into it real quick. The very first verse. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. I, we've been in a series I've been calling uh, uh, Through Mary's Eyes. Um, and this is the first time we've gone into Matthew. Uh, Matthew is generally looked upon as the Christmas story from Joseph's perspective. And Luke has a lot to do with uh, Mary's perspective. They believe that Luke, the gospel writer, interviewed Mary for much of the material in his, uh, his gospel. So that's why we get uh, a different kind of feel for it. But uh, we're introduced to this character, Herod. Herod the Great. Let's talk about Herod the Great a little bit this morning. Herod was crowned king of the Jews by the Roman Senate in 40 B.C. in Rome. It was, however, a, a king without a kingdom. <coughs> Excuse me. Upon his return to Israel, to the land of Israel, he was given a Roman army and uh, eventually was able to capture Jerusalem. The first order of business that he had was to em uh, eliminate anybody he considered a thre threat to his throne. Anybody he considered. Uh, in 37 BC, Herod killed uh, 45 leading men of the region. He eliminated his brother-in-law, uh, Aristobulus, who was at the time an 18-year-old high priest, he told, according to the information I read. Uh, he uh, had his uh, brother-in-law drowned 
that was in 35 BC, Herod's men drowned him in the swimming pool in the Winter Palace in Jericho. Because Herod thought the Romans would favor Eretobulus as a ruler of Judea instead of him. So he just limited him. He also had his mother-in-law executed. Now I think that's a really bad idea, Mom. I <laughs> just stating for the record, I think that's bad. Bad idea. He even killed his uh, second wife, Merimini, Merarimi, in 29 B.C., Herod uh, also had three of his sons killed, one of which he had uh, killed only five days before his own death. And uh, Herod the Great became extremely paranoid during his uh, last four years of his life. On one occasion, he had 300 military leaders executed. Uh, Herod the Great. The Emperor uh, Augustus remarked, it is better to be Herod's pig uh, than to be his son. That was the kind of man, that was the kind of man, the kind of world, uh, the kind of man that was ruling, the kind of world that Mary's firstborn son was born into. Uh, look again back as we have dealt with last week at the words of the angels to Mary uh, her, that fateful day whenever he visited her, uh, Luke 1.30. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child. And give birth to a son. You will give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob. His kingdom will never end. You know, I don't know how much political savvy Mary had. But there's a good chance she understood that, that those were troubling words, especially with Herod in control. You know, the, the, she, uh, she would have had the average concerns of a mother, firstborn son in that day, um, but her fears were extended on an even broader level. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid. Then comes the story of the Magi from the east. During the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw a star in the east and have come to worship him. When King, heard, King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all of Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all of the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem and Judea, they replied, For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of all my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search of the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I, that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on the way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped at the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where they stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I will call my son. When Herod heard or had realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity where two-year-olds and under. In accordance with the time, he 
he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he had heard Achilles was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So it was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, he will be called a Nazarene. Thank you, Shane. The story of the Magi um, coming from the east. Um, you know, we, we generally look at Three, we think about three, of course, we don't know whether it was three or, or how many, uh, two or what, because when we look at the, the fact there are three gifts, could have been three, who knows. Um, but again, it would have been apparent that Mary had a, a, a lot to worry about. A powerful ruler, uh, willing to do anything he can, he wanted to, to protect his throne. And hearing about the inquiry of the... Um, the Magi, uh, he sends his men to Bethlehem in the area and uh, kills all the children, the young boys, two years of age and, and younger. Now, uh, quite often when we think about that image in our mind, we think about you know, hundreds of kids, hundreds of kids. It, we really don't know how many. And a little town like that, one commentator said, you know, it was probably maybe more around 20 children that we're talking about. I don't know if that makes it better or worse. Know, that idea. In some way, the idea of just a small community with just 20 children makes it more personable. Um, everybody would have known somebody. Everybody would have known the child, a child, the name of a child, or, or whatever. You know, I'm just the kind of guy that uh, hates movies or stories that involves the killing or the kidnapping of children. I just hate the thought of it. Um, and, and when, you, when you learn about it actually happening through news reports, uh, I have no kind words or thoughts for the perpetrator. And Herod was apparently just a very, very evil man. Pause. That thought. Consider the place of Bethlehem and the place that it plays in the Nativity story. Uh, there is one way to study Scripture and one way to study scripture is to look at first mention of something. Uh, you, you kind of get an idea of, of, of a theme that will go out the Bible often when you look at the first mention. Uh, the first mention of Bethlehem, surprisingly enough, is clear back in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 35, verse 16. They, this is uh, Jacob and his family, they moved from on from Bethel, and while there was still some distance from Ephrath, Rachel, his favorite wife, began to give birth and had great difficulty. And she was having a great difficulty in childbirth. The midwife said to her, Do not be afraid, for you have another son. And as she breathed her last breath, for she was dying, she named her son Benoni. But his father named him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. Over her tomb, Jacob set up a pillar, and to this day, that pillar marks Rachel's tomb. You know, connected in the, uh, the history of Bethlehem is there this interesting dual theme that you find. Connected with Bethlehem and other parts of scripture. Uh, and I would call it a, a dual theme of, of blessing and sorrows. Blessings and sorrows. Um, Rachel was having trouble in her childbirth, uh, which would have been probably a too familiar occurrence in that day. Rachel gives birth to her son, and in her last breath, she names him 
uh, Benoni, which means uh, son of my sorrow. Son of my sorrow. Sorrow. Jacob takes his newborn son and, and renames him. Benjamin, son of my right hand. Son of my right hand. You have sorrow and you have blessing. And, and then there's these two interesting prophecies connected to the town of Bethlehem. The Magi meet Herod, they enter in, and they tell him they've seen a star, and the star is telling them, I don't know how they understand this, but the scripture says it's true, uh, that there's the birth of a new king. Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, again, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who's born king of the Jews? Can you imagine Herod's blood pressure rising up at the mention of that? We saw his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. You know, you know, I want to ask a question. How stupid are these wise men? <laughs> you know? Could they not have known that a guy like Herod would have been threatened with this kind of greeting, this kind of inquiry? When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. Let's see, where am I at? Okay, one more slide. King Herod is all the Jerusalem with him. Uh, duh, all of Jerusalem understood what was at stake here when he called together all the people, the chief priests, the teachers of law, and asked them uh, where the Christ was to be born in Bethlehem and Judea, they cried. I guess I'm a slide ahead, but you follow me. Again, I've got a question. If the chief priests and the teachers of the law know that the Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem, where should they be? Bethlehem, right? But we have no, no evidence that they made any effort to go to Bethlehem to see the news that was going on. Perhaps they were afraid of what Herod would have done if they had gone there to pay homage to the new king. But the text goes on. Now I'm finally caught up. For this is what the prophet uh, has written. But you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judea are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. That prophecy is referring to a passage in the book of Malachi. You're getting a little biblical education this morning. I'd like to do that for you. Malachi 5.2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrath, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel whose origins are from old, from ancient times. So, so you got this, this beautiful prophecy, which tells about an, an honor that Bethlehem has. In fact, the idea of, of getting Jesus born in Bethlehem was something that, that moved the whole Western world at the time. Because the, the, the ruler said everybody has to go to their hometown to be taxed. The whole Western world has moved around, the, world, the Roman Empire has moved around just so that a couple can go to Bethlehem to have this child. So there's the blessing. The ruler of Jerusalem was to be born there. There's the blessing. But then there's the other prophecy, a much darker one. <coughs> Matthew 1.18. A voice is in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because... They are no more. Matthew is referring to a passage out of Jeremiah. And this is what Jeremiah said. Oops, excuse me. Jeremiah said, uh, this is what the Lord says. A voice is heard in Ramah, mourning and great weeping, Rachel weeping for her children who refuse to be comforted because they are no more. Now that passage in Jeremiah, Jeremiah is writing about a time that's on the screen uh, where... Uh, Though Jeremiah is, is being prophetic, he is referring to a time where 600 years before Christ was born that there was uh, uh, an incident of weeping in, in Israel. And this is what Warren Brisby talks about. It grew out of the captivity of Jerusalem. Some of the captives were taken to Ramah and Benjamin, and, Benjamin and, remind, and this reminded Jeremiah of Jacob's sorrow when Rachel died. However, it was Rachel, meaning Bethlehem, who was weeping. She represented the mothers of Israel weeping as they saw their sons going away to captivity. It was those Rachel said, I gave my life to bear a son, and now his descendants are no more. 
So Jeremiah is talking about a time that was current in his day where the children were taken away from them and they were taken to Bethlehem and the, the parents would see the child no more. What he didn't know, or maybe he did know, was that he was being prophetic. Talking about another time that would come when the children of Bethlehem, the parents of Bethlehem would be weeping. So you have this, this sorrow. The blessing of the rulers to be born. Sorrow the murder of the innocents. <coughs> Even the arrival of the Magi has both its blessing and curse. <coughs> they bring with them these, these great gifts. We know about them. The, the gold, the, the frankincense, the incense, and, and the myrrh. And they would have been tremendous gifts for uh, a family like Joseph and Mary, obviously poor parents, present, uh, peasants to receive. No doubt it helped them finance their sudden exile to Egypt. Another prophecy fulfilled. So you have this blessing. You have this beautiful blessing, this, the, the gifts of the Magi. But then you have the Magi informing Herod that there's a baby to be born. Sorrow. Even the very life of Mary is an example of this, this pattern. You are to be the son of the, the mother of the son of the Most High. What a blessing. And later in the temple, when they have this fascinating encounter with Simeon, a prophet, he tells Mary some chilling details. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many of Israel, and it will be a sign spoken against so that the very thoughts of many hearts were revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Blessings and curses. A sword will pierce Mary's soul. You see this pattern over and over again in the Christmas story. Connected with Bethlehem, connected with Mary, connected with the Magi, connected with you know, and I, I don't know why I preach on passages like this. Um, once again, I think I find myself dealing with an unpopular theme. It's not like you send out Christmas cards with images of the murder of the innocents in Bethlehem, although it's part of the Christmas story. Uh, you just don't dwell on it this time of year. You sing about joy to the world as we, sh as we should, a little town of Bethlehem, how still we seem to be alive, and so forth. Maybe I look at it because, well, I, I like to challenge myself sometimes. And it's not really a passage that I've dealt with before. Certainly the, the murder of the innocents is, uh, is not something that many pastors get up on a Sunday morning preach about. Blessings and sorrow. But that's true of life, is it not? Right? There is in life, and there always will be both blessing and sorrow. And it seems most especially true this time of year. What is it about Christmas that brings out such drama in our lives? I, I looked up an article on psychology today. It says, we are told that Christmas, for Christians, should be the happiest time of year. An opportunity to be joyful and, and grateful with family, friends, and colleagues. Yet, according to the National Institute of Health, Christmas is the time of year that people experience a high incident of depression. Hospitals, police forces report high incidents of suicide and attempted suicides. Psychiatrists, psychologists, and other mental health professionals report a significant increase in patient complaining uh, about depression. One North America survey reported that 45% of respondents dreaded the festive season, Christmas. <laughs> Maybe some of you here are facing that uh, some kind of sorrow this season. I don't know. The, the possibility of facing a family member that is a source of pain. The, the, the blessing of getting family together and yet the sorrow because of the interaction that's there. The possibility of, of, of a Christmas with 
where this perhaps Christmas is one wrought with financial difficulty and it's not as merry or bountiful as it has in the past. Or maybe the recent death of a loved one means uh, facing a Christmas without them by the tree for the first time, or even close by phone. Mary Lynn was sharing some of our Christmas stories with the ladies the other night, and you know she was kind of reminding me of some of our Christmases. We've had some uh, interesting ones, uh, uh, some of them particularly tough. Uh, one story she shared was the story about uh, uh, when we were still in Oregon, and um, the introduction of Tara, our daughter Tara's cancer diagnosis came into our life, came into her life. So it was diagnosis, and, and then it was a surgery, a particularly difficult surgery. And this was around uh, that time of year, and uh, we, we were, it was our year to have the whole family together. And this is how some families do it, don't you? Uh, the kids grow up and they get married, so some Christmases they're all away, and some Christmases they're, they're over here. And in Oregon, out on the coast, this was our year to have the whole family together. And, but then the cancer, then the surgery, and I wanted so much for Tara and Ben to be there. Be able to make it all the way from Oregon to uh, Oklahoma to the Oregon coast. Um, and if there's anybody that could have done it, facing a major surgery, I'm, I knew that if anybody could do it, Tara could. She's the kind of girl that if she's determined, she will make it. Uh, but at last, Mary was back in or Oklahoma, and I was in Oregon, and helping Mary, Tara recover from surgery. And we realized there was just no way that she was going to be able to make it. Um, you know, it didn't matter if it was our turn or not blessings and sorrow that comes at Christmas. And while my prayer for you always is that God will bless you and that your Christmases will always be merry and bright, it is true that there are no guarantees. So what is the point of the message? What is the point of the message? Maybe some advice. Just some advice. Well, what do I do when sorrow comes to my life? Uh, number one, I, I accept the fact that life is unfair. And I, I think that there's this particular bit of advice is especially needed probably by somebody here today. You can spend every waking moment of your life crusading against injustice, correcting wrongs in our society, correcting wrongs in your world, but you're not going to save the world. Uh, the issue of the problem with the world, it goes deeper deeper. It, it, it's a heart problem. It's a sin problem. That doesn't mean that you don't try to help, but the problem that some people go through, when they go through life, they become cynical and, and bitter and resentful and disillusional and saying, why has this happened to me? Why has this happened to my family? Mary had it difficult, but from all we can tell that she accepted what God was giving her, both the blessings and the curses. Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have what? But take heart, I have what? I have overcome the world. So there, there is hope in that. You can't control the circumstances of your life, but you can control how you react to them. God can teach you how to respond positively to the injustice in life. So, so accept the fact that life is unfair. Two, life is unfair, but I will do the right thing anyway. I will do the right thing anyway. Isaiah 117, learn to do right. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the cause of the fatherless. Leave the case of the widow. Do what you can to gain justice for others. The righteous care about justice for the poor. Christians should fight for civil rights for the oppressed. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with what? Good. Good. Overcome evil by being resentful. Overcome evil by retaliating. Overcome evil by getting revenge. No. 
overcome evil by good. Three, wait for God's reward. Wait for God's reward. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that outweighs them all. Talking about our troubles. I like how the message puts it. These hard times are small potatoes compared to the good times, the lavish celebration prepared for us. And this is another thing that we find in Scripture, especially in the New Testament, that, that God is faithful, God will reward you, God will set things right. In fact, He will reward you according to Mark chapter 10, He will reward you a hundredfold. One day God will wipe away every tear. Amen? He's going to balance the books one day. Amen? He will settle the score. He will get even with injustice. Until then, we do the right thing. Remember, remember, keep the eternal perspective. Um, you know, I, I don't know when you talk about that sad day in, in Bethlehem. I, I don't know how you respond to that exactly. And I don't know that this necessarily response goes well outside of the Christian circle. And while what was done in Bethlehem was a terribly evil thing, those children deserve their life. Those parents deserve to have their children and enjoy their life. They deserved all that. Yet every single one of those children woke up in heaven. Eternal perspective. And Herod got what was coming to him. Right? God set things right. God is the great judge. And from the paternal perspective, what we are suffering right now, what you are perhaps suffering now, from the eternal perspective, what you are dealing with right now, the sorrow diminishes important. From the eternal perspective, our time, our talents, and everything that we are giving compared to the great plan ahead, diminished his importance. Going back to uh, the story of Rachel giving birth to her son, uh, Benjamin, ben son of my sorrow. Now, when, when you look at scripture, you need to understand that so often it is pointing towards Jesus Christ. And what did the prophets say about Jesus? That he would be a man of sorrow, full of woe. Benoni is a prophetic utterance of Jesus Christ. Jacob takes his son. No, his name's not Benoni. His name is Benjamin, son of my right hand. Where is Jesus Christ right now? At the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. He is a picture. Jesus Christ himself lived a life of sorrow and blessing, sorrow and blessing. In this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. I don't know what kind of Christmas message that is for you today, but that's what the Lord laid on my heart, and I just wanted to give it to you. God bless you. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, Thank you for the joy that we do can experience at Christmas time. And Lord, there are perhaps uh, people here today that I'm speaking to that are on that sorrow side of that scale. Lord, I know there are some here today that are experiencing that. I pray, Heavenly Father, that the words I have overcome the world speak volumes to them, to their heart, to their soul. They would be lifted up and empowered and, and have a sense of your presence. And in the midst of it all, Lord, there would be a blessing. There would be joy. There would be joy to the world. Lord, we live in a world that, um, that goes between that sorrow and blessing. I pray, Heavenly Father, that uh, we would be that light of hope in our place, in our world. Lord God, just guide us and help us to be your light. Thank you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Don't forget to get...
see Mary Lynn or her mother-in-law, my mother-in-law back there somewhere. <laughs> love you. I love you. Goodbye. <laughs>